This mountain, we call it Rainbow Mountain, and rainbow is a misnomer. It's a distortion of the word rainbow. The earliest we know humans were here in North Alabama was about 13,000 years ago. What I want to talk to you about is, is, is sort of a different history. It's the geology of the area. And when we start talking about geology, we're talking massive and we're talking a large time frame. So instead of 100 to 12,000 years or more, we are talking about a time before man, before dinosaurs. And for this area, we're talking about going back to around 350 million years ago. So we're talking about a long time that, that this material that, that we walk on today has been around. And it itself tells us a history of this area from the geological standpoint. Uh, during that time, 350 million years ago, this was all buried by a shallow sea. It was, uh, we had Laurasia up north of us and we had Gondwana land down below us. And, and right in this area, there was a shallow sea that basically helped deposit all of this material that we, we see today. That sea deposited a lot of limestone and the base of this mountain is all limestone based. And, but we also had uh, coral reefs, so we had life here at that time. The coral reefs are like today, they would build up their own limestone beds or coral reefs, and there would be little creatures that would come out of the coral and, and be filtering the, the food out of the ocean water and so on. So if you look at most of, of the mountain, you'll, you'll find things like, like this. It's a, it's a fossil coral, 300 to 350 million years ago. They formed colonies like this at times. At other times, there were independent, would come out and just attach itself to a rock. But you also find some things like uh, Archimedes fans. What you find is something that looks like a screw. And when that existed, there was coral material that would come off and fan around this screw. There's also uh, what we're called crinoids. So the crinoids are sort of like flowers of the ocean. They have a very narrow stem, and if you find the fossils from those stems, what you'll find are little vertebrae-like things that, that have broken off of that stem. And then you get to a little further up, and you get to where we are here, and what you'll see are, are a couple of indications of delta deposits. And you'll see those in the form of cross bedding, so you'll see that a lot of sand layers have this sort of slanted formation to them. In other parts, and even here, if you look up at the top of some of the rock, you'll see what are called ripple marks. So you'll see these nice, smooth, ripple-looking things. Those also indicate either a, a beach deposit uh, as you get to the gentle water and form these little ripple marks, or sometimes on shallow or calm rivers, you'll find that as well. Our oldest deposits for, for this area would be the limestone. As you go up, you'll find rocks like this, which are basically sandstone, so they have a, a sandy feel to them. But also, if you look closely, you'll see lots of broken shells and broken bits and pieces of, of sea life uh, in, the, in the rock. And this indicates a beach deposit. So before, when all of this was a, was a sea, the deposits weren't just here on the mountain, they occurred out there in the valleys as well. And one of the things that sort of protected some of the limestone is this, this sandy layer on top, the sandstone. The sandstone provides protection as rain comes in, seeps through, picks up acid. That acid seeps in the ground and starts to, to dissolve the limestone underneath. So why did this stay and that not? A lot of it has to do with the patterns of rivers that start to form. Some of it has to do with, again, maybe the capping here is just a little bit stronger than it was over there. And I know behind me, you see a, a more recent phenomena than what we were just talking about. You see uh, what's called balance rock. And it's a piece of, of sandstone or layers of sandstone that now are sort of carefully balanced on the rock where there's a piece that for some reason is just a little more stable than the area around it and so it will stay there while everything around it falls. 
The earliest we know humans were here in North Alabama was about 13,000 years ago. So this would have been at the end of the Ice Age. Things were just starting to warm up and the, the Paleo-Indian cultures um, had made it into North America and uh, established a foothold here in the Middle Tennessee Valley. So a lot of the sites we find on, on the mountains like this in North Alabama are probably archaic groups. Um, little hunting bands splintering off the main settlements and heading up into the uplands to hunt deer most likely or to search for certain plants that they would have exploited. And they may have been the first people to see Rainbow Mountain. Possibly one of the main draws that brought prehistoric hunter-gatherers here. This is a sparkleberry bush, and it's a relative of the blueberry. It's not terribly common in the Huntsville area. It only occurs on some of the rocky sandstone outcrops in the highlands. Probably one of their only sources for it within miles. So here's another plant prehistoric people could have come up here to exploit. Little berries here, when they're ripe, they turn uh, kind of a nice reddish color, and they're edible. A single hunter-gatherer group, could be as old as Paleo-Indian, probably archaic, uh, coming through here thousands of years ago, uh, stopping up on top of the bluff here and maintaining their stone tools, maybe resharpening their spear points, making a scraper. Anything we do see is probably just going to be little, simple, small hunting camps. Maybe just occupied once, maybe occupied repeatedly over thousands of years by very small groups of people. The one site, the one archaeological site we have recorded on Rainbow Mountain follows that pattern. And it consists of just a simple scatter of what we call lithic debitage, uh, lithic debris. It's little flint chips and pieces, tiny pieces of stone tools, just the byproduct of stone tool maintenance. So I've never found any artifacts, not even a little flake of flint on this section of trail. But here's this little point tip. You can see the bottom's broken off, but this is this is the pointy end of it. And the little serrations on the side suggest it was probably a, a hafted knife, a stone knife, that was resharpened. They put the serrations on there to uh, make the edge sharper again. And you see uh, edge treatment like this in a late archaic period, 5000 and 3000 BC. This is a piece of a spear point, the tip's broken off, and it's triangular, a type we call the Camp Creek point. This would have been used during the Middle Woodland period between roughly 300 BC and AD 500 or so. This is a later type. This is called a Hamilton and Curvet point, and it's one of the first true arrowheads. So where that previous point was a, a spear tip, this would have gone on an actual arrow to be launched with a bow. Much smaller, lighter, thinner. And this dates to the late woodland period. Based on this point, we know people were here as late as around AD 1100. These, these early Native American groups consolidated into more locally conscripted populations where instead of widely ranging in little hunter-gatherer groups across the landscape, they would have settled down in a specific area. When Europeans first arrived in North Alabama, uh, there, were, there was a very minor Native American population. Uh, the Cherokee had established farms uh, coming down the Tennessee River into uh, eastern Madison County. Three different Indian tribes claimed this area. It was Cherokees most commonly known in the area. They, some of them lived nearby in villages. But the Chickasaw hunted occasionally in the land and so did the Creeks. And they had a kind of unwritten policy between the three tribes that they hunted different seasons so they didn't encounter each other and have fights. And I thought that's a pretty civilized way of dealing with the situation. When this land first became open for settlement, which was in the very early 1800s, there was land available in what's now known as Madison County. There was a big land rush to move into this area. 
because you could buy land from the federal government after they surveyed it. Now, I'm talking before 1818. Some of the land in, in the first part of Madison County could be bought for as little as a dollar or two dollars an acre. The Eastern newspapers, like in Virginia and the Carolinas, they ran stories about this new territory called Madison County when it was Mississippi Territory. And it's found that the land is so fertile and annual average yield per acre of cotton would bring you a $400 return. And they were leaving because their land was no longer fertile. A guy named Elisha Rainbow was born in North Carolina, lived for a little while in Tennessee, far eastern Tennessee, moved from there to Kentucky. And from Kentucky in 1807, he started moving down this way. He came to this area and he saw this mountain and he said, that's home. And they settled with Elijah Rainbow, settling on the north end of the mountain where it overlooks what today is Highway 72. Judge Thomas Taylor's History of Huntsville, Alabama. He wrote a book in 1886. He was old enough that he had talked with some of the pioneers who were still alive. So when he wrote about this part of the county, he wrote about Rainbow Mountain, and he said its original name was Rainbolt after Rain, the settler, Rain, Elisha Rainbolt. <laughs> uh, this mountain used to have a lot of features that are not visible today because they've changed. When the pioneers came here, the water table was very high compared to today. This mountain was recorded as feeding 34 springs off of the mountain. There's not many of those springs still flowing, but that's what creates part of the waters of Indian Creek today. Uh, Mill Creek comes from the springs of this mountain. Bradford Creek comes from the springs off this mountain. I love these rock boulder areas and it brought my kids and grandkids up here and the neighbor kids. They love playing on rocks like this. My children were both born in Texas in the flat land, so they, they, this was a wonder to them. More, more fun than Disney World.